G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and I actually recorded this video once already. Uh, it was ad libbed, same as this one. And the problem was, I had some major issues with the audio recording, and so you end up with this massive set of uh, errors and echoes and such to the recording. So this is take two, and sadly, take one was really good, uh, apart from that audio error, so I am spilling. Anyway, I want to talk about the Rogal Dawn Battle Tank, and it is not a vehicle I'm a huge fan of, but bear with me here, I don't just, I don't dislike the vehicle. I just don't love the vehicle. And for some reason, because the internet is full of grown adults who can register nuance, people will look at a statement like that and go, oh, well, you know, what the hell's going on here? You just hate everything. So, no, no, no. There are things that are good about it and there are things that aren't so great about it. But rather than talk about all those things, I want to talk today about real tanks, different design elements, inspirations, that kind of thing and give people a bit of an insight into tank development and interesting things about the tanks. So with that in mind, the first thing I'll say is Rogal Dawn is an awful, awful name for a battle tank. Yes, I get that it's been called the Praetorian and such, but he's the Praetorian of Terra. He is a defender of that planet, whereas a tank like this is clearly an assault tank so the name doesn't make sense and to be honest i was never a big fan of the whole uh lehman russ battle tank naming convention anyway i like my tanks being named after regular humans in the imperium i think it just suits the flavor of the imperial guard better they own what they are which is the basic humans uh of the imperial army versus the transhuman superhuman astartes who have all their own equipment anyway i was actually looking at different names and you know, we have tanks like the Malkador, we have the Macarius. Well, I thought a really good name uh, would be based on the war commander in charge of the Achilles Crusade against the Tau, and that is Sabias Corps Ebengrave. Now, I think the Ebengrave would be a fantastic name for a battle tank. The Ebengrave Battle Tank just sounds so much cooler than the Rogal Dawn Battle Tank. It just sounds pompous doesn't it uh, now anyway the design itself there are some interesting elements in this design and the first thing a lot of people pointed to was this old matey on the back of the tank hanging off it with the stubber now it may seem comical to many people that this element exists here of a guy slinging off the back of the turret shooting rounds down range that is actually a legitimate thing off of real tanks in world war ii I know it seems crazy, but there's reasons behind it. And the main reason behind it was, at the time that many of those tanks were developed, the way of mounting a machine gun onto the Coppola, for example, wasn't really a thing yet. Because uh, it was done in the late 30s, early 40s, and many countries are still getting their head around tank design. They had all these theories from the interwar years, you know, from the 1920s and 30s, of how they think a tank should operate and real experience stood on that very quickly. And so what you had was you had countries like America taking things like 50 caliber machine guns and they would just weld a big post onto the back of the turret and then slap the gun on that. And sure, you had to hop out of the tank to, to man the thing, but at least it wasn't forward of the commander's hatch, for example, where it's blocking line of sight of the tank commander who nine times out of 10 is gonna be needing to look at things to his left, right and front. The rear, on the other hand, he's unlikely to be looking that direction very often. Therefore, having the machine gun placed behind the commander and out of the way, lifted up into the air where it has good arcs and elevation, it's a very sound strategy. And so you can actually find lots of images, and here's just one, of 50 caliber machine guns mounted in this way. You can see it's a really early model um, Sherman turret there, 75mm gun, and you can see the commander's cupola there has very little vision, very few windows, it's a very small, tiny hatch, and they didn't mount the machine gun to it. The machine gun is mounted separately, and so the crew on these tanks are actually standing on the rear of the hull to fire off those machine guns. That is a legitimate thing, uh, and it has a background, and the background is we didn't think to add machine guns at the time, and so this was the most logical place to put them. Of course, that's a bit of a silly excuse by 
40k but hey who cares you know it, it, it makes sense as a design element so it's actually a thumbs up from me on that design choice um, I think the aerials being where they are next to the commander they're actually more of a hindrance because they're going to block his vision as he rotates the cupola around to actually get line of sight on the enemy speaking of the way that the turret is designed the two uh, cupolas so that's the hatches on the top there have these big cylinder shapes and they are basically protruding from the main turret itself that's a big no-no in tank turret design because you want simplicity in the design you want something like a cast or singular shape if you can or facets that you weld together but something with those kind of shapes with cylinders meeting flats and such and it looks like it's a cast turret it's it's a really bizarre design choice because that would make it very very difficult for the crew to actually or not for the crew i should say for the people manufacturing the vehicle to correctly harden and treat the metal you can't just harden the entire surface of a tank for example to the same level of hardness and then harden it throughout the solid piece of steel if you do that on a real life tank and again this isn't 40k it's just to give you some knowledge what happens is you make this armor that's hard as nails but it's it's brittle as glass what you have to have is you have to have very hard facing on the armor and a very soft backing behind it you want to do this because you want to be able to break up the round that is hitting you on that hard plate hold together the hard plate with a softer iron or steel behind it and then prevent spalling that's internal piece of steel flaking off from brittleness and flying through the crew compartment injuring the crew uh, many tanks in world war ii suffered from poor heat treatment and that led to many of the crew deaths because it was pieces of its own turret flying off on the inside or the hull hitting the crew you want to avoid that and the way you avoid that is by making nice simple shapes simple shapes with simple big flat surfaces are a lot easier to heat treat and look after that's less fatiguing they're going to have and of course you're going to get a bigger turret overall and a bigger turret overall in a tank is a really good thing because a big turret means that you can put bigger guns in have more room inside for shell stowage or for the crew to live in because obviously inhabiting a tank is a pretty horrible environment as one can imagine especially in desert climates so big turrets are good it means that later on down the line as well you go oh you know what these little guns aren't enough the enemy's got better armor we need to put a bigger gun in your turret's already the right size to do it whereas if you start with a small turret you get what happened in say the t-34 in the soviet t-34 uh tank the original 76 mil or 75 mil gun models had this very small dinky turret and when they upgraded to the 85 millimeter they put a larger three-man turret in place and actually hung over the sides of the tracks it was way bigger than the old turret you would have to do the same thing with a tank like this now that does not make this a bad tank bad design look bad anything like that it's just an interesting uh assessment of reality for you guys um another interesting thing about this is the mantlets the mantlet is the piece of armor plate that protects the turret where the guns enter into the turret that big plate the face on the front of the turret there so if we look at something like this m48 which i think is a great example of this many mantlets are these very thick very heavy cast pieces of armor on this tank though it's actually quite a thin plate uh, and it reminds me a lot in that regard of the rogal dawn and on top of that you can also see the shape of the turret it's a very simple cast shape why because again it's easy to get the properties you're after with that kind of shape the only protrusions that are coming out of it is things like the uh ir searchlight mount is that big bracket above it i believe and you have the coincidence rangefinder so that's the little knob coming out the side of the turret with a vertical slit down it that there is uh, in order to tell the distance from you to your target that's what that bit of equipment's doing you can also notice that with a design like this they would often put a piece of canvas uh, between the mantlet and the actual tank face itself the turret face and that's what all those little rivets are that you see sort of surrounding the mantlet there uh, the random protrusions in a ring around it on the face of the turret that's so you can equip a piece of canvas uh, to it and you'll see that a lot in say centurion tanks and of course in the m48 here you'll see it in world war ii vehicles quite commonly as well so 
interesting little thing to see right there. Uh, so going back from that to this design, you don't see that kind of simplicity in the turret, but you do see that kind of mantlet. I don't know, I kind of like it. I think it's neat. Um, interesting little bit of design. Then we get to the hull, and the hull is pretty interesting. So first of all, there's those... Let's just get out of the way. There's the two little nipple guns. They're a terrible idea. We'll come back to them later. But below those is this big sort of notched slit in the hull between those two nipple guns. That's what you call a shot trap. You have two pieces of plate that form a angle, and that angle guides any incoming round towards the tank hull, instead of deflecting it away, which the shape of this hull should really do. Because of that, it's actually going to help with the penetration of enemy rounds, because they're gonna hit it, hit that angle of plate, curve down, get sandwiched where that angle meets of the two armor plates, and then it, they've got nowhere to expend that energy. It has to be forced into that point. Uh, that's bad design. You just don't do that in tank. Now, they've done it probably for the rule of cool looks wise, but you just don't do that. Now, the actual shape of this tank's hull reminds me of two tanks in particular. And the first one I'm gonna go to is actually a French tank. This is a Somua tank out of the mid 1930s. And you can see it's this Basically, it's a cast hull, but all the facets of this hull are very similar. You have essentially a vertical section where the driver's vision slits are, and then over the bow of the tank, that's what we call the upper glacis, that bit of plate that forms essentially the bonnet at the front there of the tank. Uh, that there is the upper glacis plate. That is this gentle curve towards the front of the tank. And you see that here, it's the same sort of thing, a bit more angular here, but relatively the same thing. And of course, this is a lot more rounded than other uh, 40K tank designs, which is why I think this cast hull French tanks are really good uh, analog for it. And then as that glacis meets the lower glacis, that's the lower half of the armor on the front of the tank, you can see it goes vertically down and then gently curves under with a couple of anchor points there. And that's exactly what we see here. So very similar to a horrible French tank of the 1930s. Actually not the worst tank in the world, these things, but um, didn't have a great track record uh, thanks to many, many factors, which I won't go into now. It also reminds me a lot of this bad boy. This is the American um, M1 slash M6. There's a couple variants of this tank, but it was an American attempt at creating a heavy tank, something like a Tiger tank. Uh, it was a very interesting point in America's armored doctrine because going into World War II, they got a lot of things right, uh, a lot more than people give the Americans credit for. Their armored forces were trying to standardize their vehicles and not go overboard with the amount of different designs, which is something that really hurt the Soviets and especially hurt the Germans. Um, the British had issues as well, but that was because they were trying to come up with all their designs on the fly in the midst of a war and a shortage in everything. Uh, versus America, who had just infinite resources, basically. And what America was doing is very interesting at the time for those who want to read up on it. I strongly urge you, go and have a look. But this tank also shares many of those same designs because, well, form follows function when it comes to tanks. So you see that vertical upper plate where the crew is going to be looking out of the vehicle, then rounding off over the nose and you know, a couple of towing points. But what's interesting about this design is the tracks. The tracks on this design have mostly exposed road wheels with a bit of side skirt there, and they taper off towards the rear of the vehicle. So the tracks at the rear are shorter in height from the ground, the distance from the ground to the top of the track, than at the front of the vehicle, which is actually something we see in the Rogal Dawn battle tank. The rear of the vehicle, the tracks are lower than the front. So in a lot of ways, this has many hallmarks of the M6, including an ugly oversized turret, which I do still kind of like. Um, it's also interesting to note that the front machine gunner's turret, or limited traverse mounting, to be more accurate, uh, of this vehicle, is you can see it's quite a heavy mantlet on it. It's very thick, very armored. The reason that is is because you've cut a hole in the front of your tank. You've therefore created a huge weak spot in the front of your tank, so you need to armor up whatever you're replacing that hole with very heavily to cut down that weak spot. That's what that big boxy section is. But unfortunately on the Rogal Dawn, they've put this 
sort of flap, cat flap, dog door flap over the top of whatever weapons are mounted in the front, and they've heavily recessed it into the hull. That's no-no. That's big no-nos. You don't do that with hull-mounted weapons. If you want to see what it should look like, well, funny enough, those two little dinky belly guns are, are closer to the thing. Um, but a British World War One tank like this Mark IV female perfectly demonstrate it. The, there is a ball mounting here, and it protrudes forward out of the armoured housing, because you're hoping that if something hits that ball, the curved shape will deflect it away from that weak spot. And that sort of ties us in nicely to this. So obviously this is a World War I tank. Uh, this is a female tank. Now female and male, don't get your knickers in a twist guys. It refers to the armament of the vehicle. Female tanks armed with machine guns, male tanks were armed with three, uh, I think three pounder naval guns uh, that were cut down. So they started out these real long barrel guns and they found very quickly that you couldn't use a full sized naval three pounder in the battlefield because it would just get those guns buried in the ground. If you want to know what it looks like when a tank buries its gun in the ground, it looks like this. And it's hilarious. Um, this is an Israeli Merc of a tank, by the way, for those who are curious, uh, which is a pretty cool tank. But yeah, gun is firmly twisted and buried into the ground here because they didn't turn the turret to the side uh, when they went over a berm or over a cliff here. And when the tank hit the ground, it, it unbalanced and tilted forward and it tipped onto that gun, dug it straight in. That's something you want to avoid. And the way they did that in World War One was through a few different factors. One, shorten the barrels on things. Two, locate them high up on the hull. So you can see that that front bow gun is mounted very high up on the hull between the commander and the driver's hatches. Then you've also got uh, the tracks. They protrude far forward of the vehicle. And you can see the big track tensioners in that, very similar to a Lehman Rust there. That's those bolts, the gigantic bolts that point towards the outside of the vehicle. The tracks are very high up at the front of the vehicle. Why is that? because they're acting essentially like the dozer on the front of a bulldozer or a battering ram of sorts. They're the first thing that is gonna hit any obstruction or obstacle, whether it's barbed wire, whether it's a trench, whether it's a hill, crater, you name it. So all the impact is gonna be taken on the face of those tracks. And then the hull that's there, it's this very heavily sloped hull, which any mud or anything it digs into should hopefully just slide over and not drag through. And so you have the tracks high up because you're going over constant ditches and undulations because of the torn up battlefields of World War I, as opposed to a modern battlefield, which is very flat in many circumstances where vehicles don't need to worry about that. On our Rebel Dawn, we fail utterly in that goal because those nipple guns actually stick forward of the tracks. The tracks should be the most forward part of the hull and instead the uh, toe hooks and the nipple guns both protrude forward. That means your nipple guns are not going to survive the first hill you drive into. They're just going to get torn off or the tank's actually going to get wedged and stuck because these things are just going to dig into the ground. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're in magical 40k space wizards land or not. The physics is very real behind gaining traction with an armored vehicle and what things dig into. And I'm telling you, it will dig in with that shape. Now that's not so bad with say the turret. Yes, you have a long turret here that sticks far forward of the vehicle. That is fine. Modern tanks have doctrine when going over unknown hills of how to handle them. You know what they do? It's pretty simple. They turn the turret sideways 90 degrees. So if there's a sudden drop off on the other side and the tank face plants, the gun doesn't pole vault the tank into the ground. Again, Merkava. So logical design and again british tanks they knew this in world war one guys when they designed the first tanks they figured this out in 1916 so it's not too much of a stretch to think that surely they should remember this for you know 40k so i'm fine with the sponsons on the side there the little heavy bombs of sponsons the way they're designed though being all curved like that that would normally be a casting, and if it's a casting, it doesn't need rivets because it's cast. And you can, again, see this in the Somua. Cast turret, cast hull. The only bolts you're seeing are the bolts going in from the top upper glacis, bolting it to the lower glacis. That's it. 
uh, very simple, smooth designs. Whereas this tank here, it's trying to, it's trying to have that World War One uh, British Mark IV. Everything's riveted together. You know, it very much apes this design. But at the same time, it's using the design elements of this tank, and it's an odd choice. It doesn't ruin the tank for me or anything like that. But I wanted to explain to you guys why certain things are done a certain way. And if the tank is made out of one piece of homogeneous metal, or yeah, it's been clearly been welded or some sort of smooth corners here, it's not just two rigid plates butted up to each other, there'd be no bolts. Okay, all the bolts and rivets work in something like a Lehman Russ because it's very angular. Everything looks like it's literally been just bolted to a hull, uh, bolted to a frame. So, very interesting design choices there. Then we get to one of the most weird choices. And this is where you can tell that someone who probably doesn't understand tanks but saw pictures of them got involved. And that is the three big slots on the side uh, above the wheels on the tracks. Those three big slots are for, well, actually I'll show you. Here is a Matilda tank. This is a World War II tank and you can see it has these slots and you can see there's quite a lot of staining coming down them. Uh, this here is a Whippet white tank from World War One, British white tank, uh, very heavily used in 1918. And it has these giant slots as well, but as you can see, they are huge and they are very heavily sloped behind them and they go all the way up to the top of the tank where the return rollers are for the top track. What are these and what are they doing on the tank? Well, fantastic question. What they are is they are for mud removal. So you can imagine these tanks on the battlefield are driving around and they've got these big piles of mud just getting churned up, stuck on the tracks and being carried around. Over time, that mud is gonna work its way in around all these wheels on the tank and it's gonna to start to clog them up with crap and they're gonna get under the track, they're gonna get caught in everywhere. And so in these World War I era, and even World War II era tanks, they had this system here where the mud would fall off, it would fall into that angle plate and then slide out away from the tank. Nice, and it worked for the most part, but that was the idea behind the design. It, it did have limitations as you'd expect, you know, but it's designed to stop all that mud getting in there, clogging up and compacting solid full of mud. And then of course, if it dries overnight, you now have essentially a brick, a solid brick formed around your tracks, which is just horrible. It also allows you to get a bit more access in there to work on bits of the tank because that big skirt on the side of the tank there is not armor. Yes, it will have the effect of spaced armor to some degree, but it is not armor. As you can see on this M48 here, the hull itself is actually quite a bit recessed in away from the tracks. And the reason that is, is because you don't want a round to come in at an angle, hit the front of your track and deflect into an unarmored hull. That's why the skirts on the side aren't armor. They're just that, they're just skirts, they're just bits of plate. The main armor is on that main section of hull you see set inboard of the tracks. It's usually they try to make it a single piece if they can. And you'll see it in modern tanks. So that's some thoughts on that particular thing. Now, is this what I would have wanted in plastic? No, I want this in plastic. This is the Macarius battle tank from Forge World and it meets all the design criteria. More simple turret design. Uh, yes, it still has protrusions, but they're way cut down. None of the antennas or anything like that are blocking the cupola itself and the vision. The uh, front of the vehicle, the tracks by far protrude the most forward out of anything. Additional weapons on the vehicle are in heavy sponsons. They are not uh, recessed into these weird traverse mountings. They're actually in armored units. And it's just a really cool design regardless. It doesn't have, because this was designed by people, I think it was a Phil Stachinkas, so I'm gonna say, designed this one. He's a real armor enthusiast, treadhead and it shows in his work and you can tell this doesn't have features that you wouldn't have on a tank for some reason it doesn't have little mud slits on the sides that don't do anything because they're not located in the correct position and they're too small anyway it doesn't have random exposed row wheels it's got those big plates uh, that butt up to each other all over the tank and they're not smooth round castings they are hard sharp edged 
just like on this World War I tank, and that's why they're all riveted together. And you see that. So his design here, much, much better than this design here. This is designed by committee. This is designed by someone who knows tanks. And while it's not perfect, you can see it's actually kind of similar to something like the Merkava battle tank, funny enough. It's like if Merkava and a World War I Mark IV had a kid, this would probably be it. Uh, and, and I really appreciate the design. Does that make this a bad tank? No, not at all. Oh, I think it's kind of cool, actually. Uh, it's got design elements that I dislike strongly. Like, those those nipple guns are by far the worst part. And then probably that other miniature demolisher cannon. Um, yeah, those are terrible aspects of the design. But everything else is kind of fine. Uh, you wouldn't have smoke launchers located out there on top of those side sponsons because those should be automated sponsons. They're clearly too small for a crewman to fit into. Uh, you would have active defences and passive defences mounted on the turret of the vehicle because the turret's the part that's going to be facing the enemy most of the time. Uh, and yeah, go look at something like a T-14 Armada uh, video explaining the active defences on that. You'll get why it's done that way. I do like the tank, it needs those changes, and in fact, they kind of acknowledge it themselves because on the bottom image here, you can see the tank in the rear, it doesn't have those stupid little nipple guns on the front, and it looks better for it. So it just proves the point that over-design is a big problem here, and that is unfortunately the biggest thing about computer designing miniatures. Because it is so easy to take an object and to add to it, the the person sculpting doesn't limit themselves in, anymore, and the magic of traditional sculpting methods was you had to do everything slowly and monotonously. You couldn't really cut down too much on, you know, with time-saving measures. Yeah, you could make moulds of things and make little press moulds and such to help you out along the way, but you had to hand sculpt things, and because you had to hand sculpt things, uh, unfortunately for the people doing it, that often meant that it was a lot of extra work if you wanted to do something like add those little nipple turrets onto this design. And of course it creates more difficulty in making the die, making the mould for this particular vehicle. And so because of that, um, because of that, you wouldn't see superfluous features like that in a tank. And that's why those older tanks work so well, is they stuck closer to reality and they didn't have all these weird protrusions and such because of the limitations of the medium in which they were sculpted. And unfortunately, a downside of modern digital sculpting is that they have such ease of adding things. It is so easy for them to go overboard, especially if there's some marketing executive over their shoulder saying, it's gotta look cooler to impress the kids. Kids are gonna be happy with a tank regardless of the design, let's face it. Kids love tanks. I love tanks as a kid, right? Uh, that's why when I became an adult, I spent a lot of time, uh, when I became an armor in the military, I, I went and did a lot of work on tanks, doing tank restorations with the Army um, Museum and such in Bandiana. I had to work on a T-3485, even got to drive the thing, uh, worst driving experience of my life, and horribly uncomfortable tank to boot. I got to work on a lot of Bren carriers, uh, I did some work on some armored cars, I think a Saracen and something else, but yeah. Uh, so I know a, a bit about this stuff. I'm not an expert, but I know more than the average layman on this stuff. And I highly encourage you, if you're into this sort of thing, go look it up. Have a read on it. There is so much information out there um, on tanks and armored vehicles in the world. You know, go look up uh, like tank chats with the uh, over at the British uh, Tank Museum. For example, they do phenomenal in-depth rundowns on these armoured vehicles, and you learn a lot about the development and design process of them if you're into that. Anyway, that's it for me. I'm Mac the Outer Circle. This was the Rogal Dawn battle tank, but really, I think the Ebengrave battle tank would have been way fucking cooler name. Uh, whereas the Rogal Dawn name, it just sounds like it wants to be edgy, and it's it's not. Rogal Dawn's a pussy. <laughs> Mac of the Air Circle, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all on the next one.